I've spent the last few years working for one of the largest shockwave clinics in North America, and I've learned a thing or two about the power and untapped potential of regenerative medicine. But the march towards a future where sickness is healed from its root cause is challenged by the influence of big pharma and their deep pockets. So now we're forced to answer questions like, how do we get rid of joint pain, take back our performance in the bedroom, and heal diseases from the inside out without band-aid medications or negative side effects? This show will give you the answers. Follow along as I interview the world's top experts and doctors and how they transformed their lives and their patients' lives using the newest advances in biotechnology. I'm your host, Austin James Wolf, and you're listening to Modern Biotech Radio. Hey, what's going on, Modern Biotech Pioneers? Today, I'm joined by Quantified Bob. How's it going, man? <laughs> it's going great. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. Okay, guys, if you didn't know, Bob is one of the most quantified biohackers in his field. Did, am I saying that right? Is that how, would you, how you would describe yourself? Tell us a little bit more about yourself, Bob. Sure. I would say um, biohacking is one aspect of the self-quantification. and um, It actually sort of emerges more out of another movement called the quantified self movement, which probably started about 10, 11 years ago, which was really a, a group of people who realized they, they really wanted to understand themselves better through data. Um, and it may be related to things like their, their body and other things. It could just be lifestyle, behavior, um, activity, things like that. So I've always um, kind of been involved in that, that movement. And part of that was looking at how I can sort of turn the knobs and optimize elements of, of myself, whether it be, you know, exercise and training and performance if I'm playing sports or cognition, mental performance. Uh, as you get a little older, you start looking how do you can uh, optimize for things like longevity. And, um, and so a lot of people that get into this area of biohacking, it's, you know, they might just find a bunch of supplements and pills, they'll try everything. And they're like, Hey, I feel okay. I don't really don't know what's working. What's not. I just wasted thousands of dollars possibly, yeah. probably because some of those things really weren't moving the needle. Uh, and so I, I've always just taken the approach of taking a more data driven approach where um, it comes down to citizen science, self-experimentation, and, and trying to figure out what variables I can control and see you know, through data what, what things are working or not working for me. Right, right. That makes sense. What, what got you started in doing all this? Obviously, you didn't just wake up one day and start testing everything, or did you? How did you uh, become Quantified Bob? Well, the idea of, of self-quantification and tracking goes back to when I was you know, my teenage years, you know, yeah. playing sports and you're Back then, it was a stopwatch and a notebook and <laughs> pen and paper, and you were, you know, logging your workouts, seeing, you know, what you were eating, and, and trying to understand, like, how do I eke out a little more performance? As I got into the real world, and and two things happen: you get you, you're an adult, you're growing up, and you have other things in life, other stressors, other things that are kind of beating you down all the time. Uh, but also, the, the technology started rapidly advancing. Things that we could learn about ourselves that we couldn't do just a few years prior. It was like get the new ways to gain insights into ourselves that, you know, just weren't possible before. And, and so for me, it really came from that shift from just understanding myself through athletic performance and training and all of that to looking at myself when I hit a point where I was running a couple businesses, um, doing really well. I was playing I've been in bands, playing music and just doing lots of things and, and, for all intents and purposes, doing you know really well, I felt like I was just a hard-driven person. And I realized though that even if on the outside maybe things looked great and I felt I kind of people perceived that I felt great, I was just worn out. And um, and I couldn't really figure out what it was. And you know I was just like, look, I'm doing, I think I'm doing everything right here. And it really required me to start looking deeper in terms of understanding like the effects of diet and stress and um, things that maybe my belief system were all in one area and it forced me to over time through data and experimentation to reevaluate some of those things. Like when I was working out like crazy and, and really on, uh, focused on training, you know, the, the way I was eating the things, um, supplements I was taking, like I thought that was the way to do it. And I had to kind of go 180 on a lot of that. And, and, and maybe at a time, a certain point in my life, it may have been the right way to go about it. But then I realized, well, at this stage or that stage, you know, say 10 years ago, um, it really, you know, wasn't the way to go. And it was actually beating me down and, and, you know, creating other issues in my body. Right, right. That makes sense. Now, when you do your self-quantification, do you do it on a 
per habit basis. Uh, for example, you know, let's say you start trying a new diet and then you uh, measure your results for a couple months. Do you go it on like a per project basis or are there certain things that you're measuring all the time every day? Sure, there are definitely um, layers and levels to the quantification. So there's what I call this sort of set it and forget it level where let's say you're, you're wearing some kind of activity tracker, I'll have two or three on at any given time just right. to get second and third opinions. So things like your activity and sleep and heart rate and all of that just passively being collected. So no matter what I'm doing, those data points are there. Now, with regards to something like an intervention or, or an experiment where I'm going to say I'm going to change my diet, I'm going to take some supplement or I'm going to do a fasting or something like that. Um, in that case, in those cases, you, you may throw in some other types of measurements. Maybe I'm like, you know what, I need to take uh, more frequent blood pressure and breathing. So I'm going to do that for that week. I'll throw those in there uh, knowing that they were the circumstances around it were a certain experiment. Right. Now, the challenge is always that like you've got a million things you want to understand about yourself. And, and you've got what ends up happening is if you're trying to do a, 10 things at once, they're going to interfere with each other. So if I was changing my diet, and I'm trying to quantify my workouts, well, maybe one, something from that other experiment is having an effect on this other right. one and you know, those confounding variables. So you have to kind of stagger a lot of those bigger types of experiments. So some of them, you know, there, are types, there are things you can do that take a day or two, you know, quick things to understand about yourself. But if you're doing something like, you know, I'm gonna take I don't know, it's, you know, some creatine or something, you know, just a, something around strength training. And that's not something you're going to like feel or anything right away. Right. It's more like you might notice over six months <laughs> or cycling on and off a few times that there's a benefit. Um, whereas if I do, you know, a, a water, like a water fast for three days or five days, I can measure pre post things like blood sugar and, and go get some lab tests done, things like that. And, um, get, you know, get some really great insights about the effects of things. And if I layer in those other measurements like sleep and, and, uh, other biomarkers, well, you know, you can then say like, wow, look what happens when I, when I fast for, you know, this period of time. Yeah. I'm sure you've done a lot of experiments. What experiment has been the most eye opening or shocking to you? Uh, eye opening. I would say not so much eye opening as the, there's a, there's a qualitative versus quantitative. Like you might be like, I feel like I'm an excellent sleeper. <laughs> I sleep, I'm, you know, I wake up refreshed every day and you start looking at data and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, oh yeah, because you think you're in bed eight hours a night. Like, yeah, I get a solid eight every night. And yeah. you realize like, nope. <laughs> you're like, you know, you might be like, whoa, what, what's go what are all these little disturbances? And then you have to uncover like, why? What, what is creating that? Um, what are those circumstances? And then that takes a lot in itself, a whole bunch of experimentation. And, right. and you know, and so for me, it was that idea of, your perception of something not matching the reality. That makes sense. Has there been one experiment? Sorry, there's a fire truck saving people's lives outside. Yeah, right, we're good. Over here. Yeah. yeah, it happens. <laughs> um, so out of all the experiments you've done, has there been any that, I guess, changed your views or beliefs about a certain habit that a lot of people do? Sure. I mean, some of the early experiments I was doing were around diet and mm -hmm. changing what I thought was this healthy diet, eating uh, proteins of like very lean protein, cut out like almost all fat and, and um, you know, I was eating gluten and, and, and some carbohydrates, like high levels of carbohydrates. And, you know, and when I was starting doing lab tests and I was like realizing like under the hood, um, that, that stuff was really affecting me, like testosterone right. was tanked, other other issues, and and by switching to essentially um, a, a more a, more of a paleo type diet, where I was you know ch not not only changing the the macronutrient ratios that I was eating, but also the quality of the of the food I was eating and cutting yeah. things out, it had a pretty um, you know profound effect, and and so that for me was a big uh, shift in terms of again my belief system and in terms of like what. Um, what I thought was the right way of doing it. And, that, and, and what I always tell people is, because the whole beauty of this idea of self-experimentation is we're all single subject experiments. So what works for me, you know, we can make some blanket observations about things like, sure, should right. anyone eat tons of sugar? Maybe not. And, but if, you know, but there could be a case where like, hey, you can tolerate a lot more, you know, complex carbohydrates than I can maybe, or, you know, or vice versa. And some people, you know, you dial that in over time, but, but you, know, you make the big change first and then you sort of tweak it and tweak it and you realize where, where that optimal sort of level is. 
Right, right. That makes sense. <clears throat> this isn't something I was actually going to ask. I, I just thought of it. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, because this is the public interview. Have you ever tried any um, illegal substances or drugs and then quantified, you know, measured the results? Well, illegal where you did them? or I guess, yeah, like, like <laughs> marijuana or anything stronger or less strong. You don't have to answer. No, right there's, there's a big movement right now around, um, you know, they're trying to legalize um, certain types of psychedelics right. because of their effects on thing, uh, things like anxiety and depression and all yeah. of that. And, and, and this isn't like going on in big trips, you know, acid trips or anything like right. that. This is like micro doses where it's subsensory almost. And, and, and um, so there's a lot of um, study experiments going on around that. Um, there's even some ones that are uh, like through some research uh, nonprofits that are actually asking for volunteers to do it. So, right. um, so, you know, I, I would say, you know, in terms of going illegal, like I would say, like follow your laws. You know, don't, right. Yeah. You know, I, I happen to live in an area where, like, we don't have legalized marijuana. We don't mm -hmm. have like it's, you know, parts of the the parts of the country. It's, you know, sure, that's where you know you're allowed to do it, and over there, but where I live is very restrictive. Right. Right. For sure. Uh, there, there was one question in particular I wanted to ask you. Uh, I saw that you measured your heart rate when watching my second favorite movie, Interstellar. Tell me more about that. <laughs> So yeah, this is an example of just where you can set up a really fun experiment. Like I, this was a couple years back when that movie came out. Um, it was in IMAX. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna go see this movie in IMAX. And I was like, I was wearing a couple devices and I was like, well, if I put on a heart a chest strap where I can get uh, what's called heart rate variability measurements and which is more of a stress response in the body, yeah. um, measure uh, just other, other biomarkers. And I was like, and I'll just sit and watch the movie and then I'll, and I'll grab all the data that was captured. I knew when the movie started and when the movie ended. I would then analyze that data, and yeah, and it was interesting to see if you if you see the the, the data all stacked on top of each other, um, you'd uh, you can pinpoint like scenes of the movie and where, yeah, like, I was like, um, oh, that's the midpoint, that's the water planet, and I was like, yeah, oh, that's when Matt Damon, yeah, and and what's interesting, you know, so it was interesting to see like where or maybe I was like bored, you know, like everything kind of like settled down, it was like very slow part of the movie, maybe a lot yeah. of dialogue, and I was just like, eh, <laughs> kind of right. Was weird. Um, but it was just interesting to see how, you know, those, those effects on the body and just by, you know, whether it could be watching a movie, listening to music, or anything like that. And it's interesting because there are actually companies out there today. I mean, when you watch a trailer now for um, a video game or a movie, those things are so designed in a very specific way where they put them through, they actually bring in test, uh, like people to watch them while they're developing them and they monitor their biomarkers and biomarkers. Oh, wow. And so that... Cause they might go like, we wanted something where it builds up anticipation and right at the end, we want them to just be like, you know, just completely surprised. And that's why yeah. you're going to see this formula of a lot of these, especially in video games where um, it, it, yeah. And, and they're using things even like EEG where they're measuring brain activity during that. They want to make sure they're getting a heightened sense of like excitement right. or stress. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you can do that. Like I've done it also while uh, gambling. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Um, you know, I've looked at data. This is, well, I wasn't like playing poker or anything. This was, um, I think I went to like one of the triple crown horse races. So yeah, it's good yeah. because you have a race oh, wow. and there's a break and there's a race and there's a break. And you bet between each race so you can kind of reset, reset. <laughs> and I could see like what would happen like leading up to the race, the excitement. And then when it would end, um, whether I won or whether I lost, would that, you know, my, would everything come back down or stay at a heightened level? And um, so those are just, you know, those are just fun insights about myself that's good, interesting to understand but i guess you could apply it to things like if you were trying to like understand your tells in poker or something you can maybe figure out ways to um look at your data and go oh it's obvious huh. you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm bluffing here yeah right yeah that's fun um is there a particular type of quantification or measurement that you think people should be doing every day or at least once a week I would say every day, um, something I do is I, I measure my heart rate variability every day. Um, so you, we talk about heart rate, which is like, okay, my heart beats 60 beats a minute. Heart rate variability is a, a different measure in that the, the beats aren't exactly one second apart. It might be like 1.05 seconds and then 0.99 seconds. And, and that shift is like called heart rate variability. And it's a, it's a sign of our body's, um, kind of sympathetic versus parasympathetic um, balance, meaning our, our, our fight or flight, like we're really stressed out, like something's going to attack us or rest and digest. And the higher your HRV is, um, 
it tends that's when your body is more at that rest and digest stage. So you can trend this over time. So once you have your baselines, you're looking at day-to-day -day fluctuation variability. Um, it can do things like predict onset of like some illness. Uh, if you're overtrained, it can tell you, it can say, you know what, take it easy today. Just do some re restorative stuff. Your body's like a little, you know, it's a little beaten down. Obviously, if you were out the night before, you had one, you know, a few too many drinks, um, you'll see that knocked down. And so understanding your heart rate variability, it takes literally two minutes. Um, I, I, I use a little sensor that I just put it, my finger in this little device. It goes right to my phone. Two minutes, I, I do before I even get out of bed. And I just, you know, first thing in the morning, I do it. You, you can measure heart rate variability at any time, but if you're trying to get a comparison day over day, um, and a lot of, a lot of the um, wearables now, their apps, uh, well, the wearables themselves will um, measure overnight heart rate variability. So it's a yeah. different, it's the same concept, but the numbers will be a bit different because what it's doing is looking at the trend throughout the whole night and then averaging it out. So you may have low points and high points. So um, that could be in something like detecting um, if some, you know, you ate something, you ate something really late before bed or um, there's disruptions in your, in your sleep environment. So um, I would say heart rate variability is something that everyone could start understanding. Now on a bigger level of, of, just general health and wellness. And I, I, I think everyone should get a glucose meter and start um, just playing. I mean, these devices cost like $30 yeah. and you can, you, you prick your finger, draws a drop of blood. You, there's a little um, test strip that goes into a meter and within 10 seconds, it gives you your, your glucose reading. Now, normally you would go to the doctor once a year and they're going to say, you know, your, your fat, your fasting glucose is some number and you're either diabetic or, or pre-diabetic or not. And the thing is, there's so much variability in, in these numbers. Um, it, it fluctuates throughout the day. There's a circadian rhythm to it. There's also, depending on meals you eat, um, this is where I've been doing a lot of my experiments lately, uh, is with understanding all the, the effects of different foods and meal and food combinations, um, and, and to really uh, to basically optimize what we call metabolic health. So yeah. to me, that's, you know, we're talking about society and problems we have. I mean, obviously we have other things going on as well right now, but from, um, but these are leading to factors that are putting people at risk for these other things that are happening in our, in our world right now. So I think, you know, if you're measuring heart rate variability, um, that's something that's very easy to do. You know, sleep is tricky because people get obsessed. Um, there's actually a term called uh, orthosomnia. <laughs> it's like, it's basically people that get obsessed with, you know, getting better sleep. And if they don't, yeah. they get depressed or sad or, um, oh my God. and, and the problem is most of these devices, the accuracy of knowing whether you're in deep sleep or in dream state sleep, uh, it's, it can be really finicky. So really the important numbers are just your total sleep duration, having consistent be um, bedtime and wake times, but also, um, you know, looking at disruptions and you want to minimize those disruptions because you could, you know, in the extreme case, someone could have uh, like, a, like a sleep apnea. Maybe they don't yeah. even realize it because they're not, you know, they're waking up, going back to sleep, waking up, going back to sleep um, or just some other issues. So. Those are definitely um, things that I think uh, people should always, you know, should be paying attention to. Yeah, that makes sense. What is a technology or measurement that you wish was available, but it's not yet? Um, well, man, there's no, <laughs> there's <lots laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the miracle, like, um, take one drop of blood and it can just basically have yeah, a mass spectrometer and just analyze, detect everything from presence of different cancers to, you know, hormone levels. Yeah. Hormone mm -hmm. levels that day. And, you know, it's, I mean, you're, there's a lot of stuff that's happening in labs. Um, it's just a matter of them um, commercializing it. Um, now, but I wish, you know, on a more consumer level, I guess there isn't much of a market for this other one, but, um, like we have the, now we have glucose meters that they're like the size of a quarter and they, and they're continuous glucose meters. You, you would hear them to the back of your arm and they collect data nonstop. And yeah. so, and it lasts for 14 days and you get all sorts. Now you know what happens while you're sleeping. You get much more, um, instead of you having to prick your finger every time you want a reading, it's just doing, it's just sampling all the time. I want to see that same sort of technology applied to ketones because, oh, uh, yeah, because right now we can also, the same, the same meters that measure glucose, which is your blood sugar, We'll also can also measure ketone bodies, which, so if we're, if we're people that are going on ketogenic diets or you're trying to shift your body to, be, to use fat for fuel versus carbohydrates, you know, you're really, those are important numbers to know. Um, but obviously <laughs> developing a, a sensor that would do that for ketones, I think is, uh, 
I guess there would have to be a, you know, a, an actual larger market than the fringe, you know, <laughs> biohacking community for, for that. Right. Of course. It's definitely growing. That would be very interesting to see. Yeah. Do you have a favorite supplement? I mean, you know, in the early days, I was one of those guys that, you know, he took two handfuls of pills and, ah, yeah, yeah. Everything. Dave Asprey. and, and I, you know, for me, it was more about, um, understanding, like, what are the essential things? What am I not getting from my diet? What am I not mm -hmm. getting? Um, maybe, maybe it's something where there's a, a time or a moment where, um, it's something's needed. So I might cycle in something, but you know, I would say like favorite, a favorite supplement. I mean, there's a whole class of. Uh, supplements called nootropics, which yeah. people take for um, focus, memory, cognition. You know, they're, they're naturally occurring substances like amino acids and things like that. Um, the challenge with them is most of them I've tried have very little effect on me. Like I just my biology just doesn't work huh. with them. But what I but what I do what I have found was there's there's a couple that like I, there's one called L-theanine that right. um, that is actually synergistic with caffeine. Right. So it actually gets it, you put you combine the two and you and it, it helps you it just puts me in a great like a few hours of like focus and i like to take it in the morning actually um so i'll have my cup of coffee and i'll i'll take my l-theanine or i'll i'll stir it in um and that you know i i don't do that every day because i don't think any supplement other than maybe like your multivitamin or something is something that you want to be taking all the time i think you know i use them as tools i have i mean i've, I've i have things like from a nootropic standpoint um like if I have a, 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 if I need to focus for several hours, um, maybe once a week, I'll, I have nicotine gum and I'll, uh, I'll break off half the, I mean, I'll smoke. I don't like, so nicotine has this bad rap because right. of, you know, cigarettes and smoking, but actually <laughs> nicotine is actually a really powerful, like almost like caffeine, but even, even better. And, um, and you're finding these synergistic, um, like an effects where, I, you know, for me, it just, cause I guess, cause I'm not a smoker. I, I it's just, it just, my body really responds when I take a little bit of it. Um, yeah. and not, not at addictive levels or anything. It's just like a, you know, not even a full piece of gum. It's like a, a tiny, like break off a piece of it. Um, so that, you know, in terms of that kind of stuff, I mean, there's, there's a lot of supplements out there now where people are taking for, um, you know, from the, in the longevity sort of space. Um, the, the challenge is it's like, that, you know, you take, people are taking stuff. They won't know if it's working for, <laughs> 30, 40 years. Yeah. So, um, you know, but there are people probably where if, if they're at a, if their bodies are just in a certain state, you're going to still feel something right away just from the standpoint of, you know, okay, I was pretty beaten down. Um, but most of those for me just, again, don't, um, seem to have much of a, you know, an impact. Right. Right. That makes sense. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay. This next question I want to ask you, um, it's a bit different. Again, you don't have to answer this. Um, but I guess just to sort of preframe it, do you know anything about shockwave therapy or acoustic wave therapy for, uh, creating angiogenesis or have you heard of it? I came, yeah, I came across the subject. I probably just through, you know, the biohacking community, mm -hmm. uh, maybe like, uh, like a year or so ago. Yeah. Um, I know a few people that have, have had some things done, um, you know, and I've gotten, um, I personally haven't, um, haven't experienced any of it. I, um, you know, I just know the concept and yeah. I can see where there's different levels of need for it. Um, I think, you know, for, you know, generally healthy young, I mean, my, this is my, <laughs> feel free to correct me, but yeah, if you're, yeah. my interpretation was always like, if you're generally a healthier, younger, um, person, um, you know, you just may not have a need for it. And then there's, then there's levels where, you know, from one extreme could be, um, just sexual dysfunction to all, and then there could be something else where it might be just be like, Hey, people have, you know, developed plaques or something or blood, you know, some, they're not suffering. They're not having these issues, but there's other ways to, you know, have other benefits from it. So, right, yeah. Right. So I'm not going to say, I, I probably know as much as <laughs> your listeners probably know more than right, I right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I have a question. As far as measuring results goes, what would you recommend people do if they wanted to get this treatment done down there? What would be sort of your first ideas as to how they could track results scientifically and not just subjectively? Well, I mean, you can break out a piece of string and a tape measure. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. You can do that. Yeah, very low tech. I think yeah. Apple, 
I think Apple has an automatic uh, measuring tool. Now. No, <laughs> no, it's like <laughs> the great you know, app. There's a ruler for like you can measure. But um, I think um, anyway, yeah, I, I would say no. It doesn't have to be that complicated. I think right. you know there um, people can take measurements um, before yeah. and after. Um, you know, you can also just you know if people are tracking sexual activity, you can see right. is there a, a change in that. Just actually logging that, or you know, keeping note of when things happen. So. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's a pretty straightforward experiment. Um, you know, if you want, you know, it's just a matter of uh, over how much time. Um, and then I guess, you know, for people to get, a, you know, usually when you, when you construct an experiment, you know, you can do like one type of experiment, just an AB experiment. Like here's the right. before, here's the after. And then you might say like, here's the before, here's the after. And then we go back to the before and see if like the, the state, you know, so um, that's how normally like you would do an experiment with like a supplement, right? You want to see like, I took the supplement, there was a shift, when I get off the supplement, the changes remain or, um, yeah. That makes sense. Okay, here's a question that I like to ask everybody. And it's a bit out of the box. What's something that's true that almost no one else agrees with you on? Hmm. Something that's true, no one agrees with me on. Well, I often don't agree with myself because, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a saying, like, I think it was Peter Thiel is like a venture capitalist and he was like, uh, that's where I got the question from. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's like, you know, strong beliefs, you know, loosely held. And that's, that's been my, you know, approach as well. Like I'm, I want people to challenge me. Like yeah. I, I like to be, you know, show me how I'm wrong or how I can do something different, whether it's, you know, peers or employees or whoever. And it's, um, but uh, in terms of something that's true, um, I mean, there's a lot of things <laughs> I could say here, but you know, I don't, could cause a uh, you know yeah. very polarizing you know very polarizing would be very polarizing. Um, I, I'll I would say that the from the standpoint of society and and health, yeah, um, you know we're are we have you know we are, we. It's just that we have this epidemic of, you know, we're talking about healthcare costs and all of this, but it really comes down to, I feel is as a society, we're not educated from the standpoint of understanding general, you know, health, nutrition, a lot of these things that develop like type two diabetes, which is the number one sort of thing in this country. Um, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And right. it, this is stuff that through education or proactive sort of just lifestyle or tracking, whatever you can, you know, you can catch the stuff coming like 20 you know, years out. And, and I just feel like it, you know, to tell people like, Hey, you know, you, you should be like taking this stuff on or proactively earlier on in, in life. Um, I, I feel, you know, it's tough because it's, you know, folks like in this biohacking community where, you know, these are typically a type people self driven, right. you know, it's like, you know, you don't always, you know, there's good and the bad. And like, you know, I might have people I know and loved ones where I can't say to them, you know, change this or change that or start doing right. this because people feel like they're, they don't want to be faced with their own, even people who start tracking, maybe they wore like a, a Fitbit and just track their steps and then right. they weren't hitting their goal. They just stopped. They don't want to see that they're not hitting their goal. So they just take the device off and stop. So, right. So I guess my, you know, to answer your question, uh, it, yeah, I think it's, it's that, you know, our, our society is, is largely um, just, we're just uneducated about health and wellness. That makes sense. If you were to write a book, what would it be about? Um, you know, I, I'd, it'd probably just be something pretty obvious, like um, just just sort of distilling a lot of this information yeah. to, to the average person in terms of, um, you know, what what you can you know use what you can use data for to improve, um, you know, to optimize yourself. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. We've done a lot of research on it. Yeah, it's a matter of distilling it. Make make it simple. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you have anyone that you look up to in this space? Um, I mean, in the space, there's just there's a huge community of people. Um, I mean, you've got people that are more kind of front and center, you know, going, you know, in terms of being uh, the visibility and being on stage and all of that. Uh, but you know, I I don't even want to like name names here, and because I, I think it's like there's a lot of people behind the scenes and people that are just friends of mine that I, you know, I respect highly. And, and yeah. it's not about who has the most Instagram followers or who, you know, goes on the most podcasts or, you know, it's really, um, cause it, it's not a competition. It's, it's right. like, I feel in this, it's just in this, um, community, 
it's really, um, it is a community. It's like everyone's helping each other out. And so everyone's guiding each other, you know, they'll ask each other for advice and um, no one, no one feels like, you know, anyone, everyone wants to share information. Um, right. And so, so I, I do feel like in this space, I mean, I mean, I will, I will say like when I first got into this, when I first kind of learned about this world, well, I was probably doing it already, but when I kind of found a book that matched it up was um, Tim Ferriss wrote a book called the four hour body. And this came out like 11 years ago, 10, 11 years ago. And it was basically this book where he's writing it in kind of a um, first person mode, but he's going through all these experiments he did on himself, whether it was trying to gain muscle, whether it was trying to improve um, some athletic performance, or he was, you know, hacking some, one of the systems in his body or something like that. And I was like, Whoa, this is, this guy's doing a lot of what, what I'm doing here. This is pretty crazy. And, um, and then from there, uh, some of the early podcasts came out, like um, notably, I think like Dave Asprey, kind of bulletproof diet and all that. But even before he had the books and all that, he was just running a, he just had a, he had a blog and a podcast. Right. And it was really great because then you were um, meeting lots of people and people that like I met, you know, even through the, through that or through the, the community 10, 11 years ago. I mean, today, like they're still very good friends of mine. Like, you know, you kind of find that you find your tribe, you know, that's one right. of the, you know, things. So, um, I, I just feel like, um, the space, you know, and, and just, and now there's all sorts of, um, aspects, you know, seeing people specialize. So within the biohacking space, you have these people that are putting the labels on of being like, we're the keto crowd, we're the carnivore crowd, we're the, um, the longevity crowd, we're, we're just in nootropics, we're, you know, optimizing, we're just, um, you know, whether it's, strength training so you you see um within this now because biohacking has really become now where it was a thing like a it, it was like this one word kind of meaning okay it's something a little fringy over here that in itself is now an umbrella for a lot of other things and i and um so now what you're going to start seeing like i was just talking to some people the other day where they were complaining and they had a reason to like there wasn't a whole lot for women specific biohacking ah, right um and and granted i've i've been to lots of events and it's I will, it is a pretty balanced crowd, probably slightly skews a little more male, right, but, right. but the, but the speakers and the topics for the large part, we're not getting into women specific, um, issues. And so now there's some, some women within the community are getting together and they're, um, kind of setting up like a, a presence for like, Hey, now women can all have these conversations, um, about topics that are very specific to them, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that is cool. I love that. Um, all right, uh, that's it. As far as the public interview goes, we're going to jump into the private one. But before we go, where can people learn more about you? Sure. Um, easiest way to find me is just go to quantifiedbob.com. And um, that's where I put all my blog post content. But uh, on social media, uh, I'm, I'm often sharing a lot of kind of day-to-day -day stuff over on Instagram. So it's just, again, quantifiedbob or Twitter, quantifiedbob. <laughs> um, or if you want to connect on LinkedIn or something like that, uh, just search for me, uh, Bob Troya. Not quantified Bob, just Bob yeah. Troya. And I'll put, uh, the, I'll put those links in the show notes for cool. you guys. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for joining me today, man. I really appreciate you sharing all that stuff. Really yeah, glad. Yeah, thanks again. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks. Want to see what the top experts have to say behind the scenes? Just go to modernbiotechradio.com and you'll get instant access to every behind the scenes interview for free. Now, these interviews are not for the public, so please don't share. But if you'd like to pull back the curtain with me and learn what secrets they reveal, just go to modernbiotechradio.com and get instant access to these interviews for free. Again, that's Modern biotechradio.com if you'd like to learn the best kept secrets that they can't share publicly but allowed me to share in private just go to modernbiotechradio.com and get instant access to all of these interviews completely free i'll see you there